Hey guys, this is Girl Got Game, and welcome back to the Royal Trap, where this time we will be romancing Prince Callum! Yay, Callum! Our last prince. So, I've uh, come to this point. I skipped ahead to this point because uh, this is where our paths branch off from the other princes. I um, basically chose most of the same options that I did in Prince Oscar's route, so if you want a refresher on what those choices entail, or you haven't seen it yet, uh, you can check that out. But otherwise, we'll be, uh... I think I'm just gonna start from this point. I'm not gonna skip ahead after this. I'm just gonna play it through so we can remind ourselves what Callum's gone through and everything. Because I've almost forgotten what his story is myself. It's been so long, so... Without further ado, let's get started. Oh, Wow, nice picture. I find Callum leaning against a tree, staring up into the night sky. He shows no sign of acknowledging my approach, but I don't doubt that he knows I'm here. Still, it provides me the chance to study his profile without having to meet his eyes. Divorced from his usual challenging expression, his features are not unhandsome. With better clothing and a more pleasant attitude, he would be fair competition in any princely brigade. Yeah, would it hurt you to be a little more pleasant? Although I know you're background isn't the greatest, so I guess I can't blame you for your attitude. <laughs> as it is, it's hard to imagine him in a ballroom as anything but a panther in ballet shoes. Graceful, but ridiculous, and yet far too dangerous to laugh at. <laughs> Interesting word picture. His focus is admirable. He is very clearly an angry young man, but he does not allow that rage to distract him from pursuing his goal. He chose a path, fitted me into his plan, and drove forward without hesitation. When Oscar complicated matters, he accepted that and kept moving. In a way, I envy him his ruthless certainty. If it were Oscar captive and missing, I can only hope that I would have had the strength and forethought to bind allies to my cause. We are not so different, he and I. We both do what must be done. Yeah, I've kind of gotten that vibe in the past, too. That he and Madeline seem more alike than, uh, Perhaps her and Oscar. I'm interested to see if that theme continues. Uh, following his gaze, I look up into the sky. And there in the heavens, he beheld the fate of the realm in a broken crown of stars. Theory? We all study the same playwrights. I'm just surprised you'd say it. Superstition would call that a bad omen. That depends on how you look at it. The man who saw that sign in the play ended up a king himself. <laughs> Besides, I don't believe in omens. Nor I. Life simply is. No one paints the sky to tell us what's to come. It is pretty, though. The sky. It never changes. Every piece moves in perfect order, like cogs and wheels. Cogs? You've studied plays, but never clockwork. I don't see why I'd want to work on a clock. <laughs> he laughs, a hint of warmth crossing his demeanor. No. Clockwork. Small devices, not just clocks. Although sometimes they are. Like this. He withdraws a small item from his pouch, and I stare in surprise. Oh. To the untutored eye, it is a small cylindrical golden box, with a notch of damage in its lid and a decorative bar laid over top. Only the quiet, rhythmic noise that emanates from within might betray its true nature. I, of course, have heard of pocket clocks, but to the best of my knowledge, they are astoundingly rare and precious. If Callum carries such a gift so casually, it would seem that even a neglected Prince of Gwellinor has more to his name than I ever imagined. Hmm. A gift from your parents? No, I made it. You made that? What? Wow. Awesome. He smiles as he puts the artifact away, but this time his smile holds its accustomed bitterness. Uh-oh. Assembled, at least. This is how I spend my hours. I construct small devices. They don't always work. I have no tutor in this, only my hands and eyes, and what written instruction I can find. Wow, you taught yourself to make that? That's really impressive. It requires patience, a steady hand, and a sense of order. I find it... calming. 
An interesting talent. But a rather odd one for a prince. What else could you do with these devices? Could you build small weapons? Traps for the unwary? Trays that move themselves? <laughs> you are a woman of ideas. If I had known how talented a prince's companion could be, I would have resented the lack far more. That's... kind of you to say. You have no staff of your own, then? No. Since I was young, my parents' attention has been devoted solely to their princess. After losing a son, I would have thought they'd treasure all of their remaining children. <laughs> well, everything's going to change now, isn't it? What do you mean? They can't ignore you anymore. Once you've rescued the heir from the clutches of evildoers, you'll be a hero. Right. What's wrong? None of your business. Uh-oh. He moves away from the tree. Don't look at me like that. I'm not your friend. You're wasting your time. Sleep, Valois. You'll need it. And with that, he breaks the conversation and leaves me alone. Aw oh, man, I thought we were having a moment there. <laughs> I don't understand. I thought we were connecting. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Perhaps that's the problem. He doesn't seem accustomed to sharing his time with anyone. Such a man would not make a good king. Hmm. Well, you can't blame him. He is, like, what, the fourth-born son or something? Ah, oh, the hours of night are spent sleeping fitfully among the sticks and stones. Years have passed since I last attempted to camp under the open stars. I'm not accustomed to it. Every noise startles me to alertness. The hum of insects, the croak of frogs, the restless slumber of my companions, the two early cries of birds. Each time I must still my heart and slip back into the darkness. I do need my sleep. When the sky begins to lighten, we arise. Oscar scavenging turns up bird's eggs and wild asparagus, foods that can be cooked that can be cooked quickly, even without utensils. Neither Callum nor I make any reference to our conversation of the night before. This morning we are strictly business. Once bellies have been filled and bladders discreetly lightened, a task considerably easier for my companions than myself, we are ready to seek the rendezvous point. Hmm, interesting. Callum leads us to a country road, his particular destination marked by a crudely carved milestone half buried in the verge. This is the place. Get yourselves out of sight. We could have hours yet to wait. Find a spot where you can be hidden and silent for as long as is necessary. <laughs> His case falls on Oscar. If you can't do that, then get back to the river and stay there where you won't make a mess of things. I can do it. You had better be right. Remember, the most important thing is that Cass is safe. Don't take any action that could endanger that. But once the way is clear, don't let those bastards get away. We understand. Oscar and I secrete ourselves into the brush. Hiding among such thick cover is simple enough. Making a nest for yourself where the smallest movement will not rustle loudly and give you away is more complicated. Even the most patient soul must shift position occasionally. It's not good for the body to do otherwise. Callum's role in this is easier. He takes up a visible position along the road, pulls out a knife and a bit of wood, and begins whittling at it. For myself, there's nothing to do but wait and think. Callum. Oh, this is, I think this is new. The more time I spend with him, the less like a prince he seems. When we first met, he was angry about being the leftover son, the one ignored by his parents after they had expended their matchmaking energies on his older brothers. They've apparently made no effort to show him off to potential brides. He has no advisors to school him in graces, or dress him to better effect. But would he even want a royal bride? He's clever and strong, but he is no leader of men. He can barely manage to interact with myself and Oscar. I can't see him spending his days in court, not even with a wisdom to give him advice. Marrying into a lesser noble house would still leave him with the same problem, if on a smaller scale. The power of the nobility rests in their skills at social interaction. Strange as it may sound, I think Callan would be a happier man if he had been born to a less prominent family, where his wit and his hands would have been enough to earn his future. Hmm. What will become of him? Will he spend his life as a bachelor tucked away in the back halls of the palace, meddling with his devices forgotten? 
Or will he be bestowed like a gift upon some old widow seeking royal favor? Or maybe a third option? Maybe he could end up married to us. That would be good, right? <laughs> he is not my responsibility. Yes, he is. Once Cassidy is safe, my forced allegiance expires. No, it doesn't. And yet, I cannot help feeling some sympathy for the man. We both face an uncertain future. <sighs> After a long and uncomfortable wait, I hear the sound of footsteps on the road. Callum hears it too, but he holds his position and waits for the newcomer to approach him. Waits, that is, for the newcomer to come close enough that Oscar and I may see without giving ourselves away. Who is it? Almost close enough. A single person in palace uniform. <gasps> Dolores? <laughs> the page stops at a small distance from Callum, close enough to talk, far enough that he can't make a grab for her. She folds her arms insolently and waits. Do you have a message for me? Oui, Amebidou. Here's the message. Give me the gold. Dolores is working with the kidnappers? How can that be? She helped me. Didn't she? The deal was a trade. Gold for the princess. No princess, no gold. Do you think I'm stupid, Lord Fancy Boy? Once you've got your princess back, what guarantees have I got you won't go after me? Since that was exactly the plan, she does have a point. You want her back, you play by my rules. And if I gave you the gold, what guarantee do I have that Cassidy is unharmed, or that you even have her? I'll take you to her. You throw me the gold, I'll guide you to where I left her, one step at a time. And keep your distance. You try to rough me up, I'll lead you in circles till she starves. Half now, half when I see the princess. Don't worry, fancy boy, I don't want her on my hands. Had enough of looking after lords and ladies, I have. Half now, no more. Fine, throw it over. A sack of coins lands with a heavy clattering at her feet. She opens it to check the contents, then, apparently satisfied, smiles. Go on with you, then. That way. Keep moving, and I'll tell you when to turn. Together, they move into the woods. Uh-oh, this isn't good. The only thing to do now is to try to follow them without making too much noise and hope we can still be ready to spring on Dolores once she's delivered on her promise. I look around for Oscar to be sure he understands what must be done and find him making wild-eyed faces at me. There's no time and we can't risk being overheard. We must rely on gesture. He points at his foot, waves his hands in a negative fashion, shrugs, and indicates that I should go on without him? I'm not sure what the problem is. Maybe he's caught somehow. Or maybe he neglected to shift position earlier, and now his feet are too numb to stand and move quietly. Whatever the cause, he is out of commission. I will have to tail Dolores on my own. I just need to drink some water. <clears throat> Continuing on. I creep through the brush, trying to keep both pale heads in sight while avoiding dry twigs and other giveaways. Callum is in the lead, moving slowly at Dolores' direction and pausing frequently to look back at her. She in turn always waits for him to move before she'll take a step to follow him, never allowing that distance between them to close. Her caution means that, if not for my presence, she would have a fair chance at escape if she t chose to run for it. It would depend on how quickly Callum could react. <clears throat> would that be enough for her? She seems a cunning sort, and I don't say that solely because she misled me earlier. Oh no. Fleeing from Callum would be even easier if he were temporarily distracted or injured. Could she be leading him into a trap? Before I can spin worse imagining, she stops. May as well come out, Miss Nosy. What? I know you're out there, Ostendaware girl. I saw you with himself last night, playing Broken Bird. Tricky. Now I can wait her all day, but your delicate lady's all alone and helpless like. So get over here. I hesitate, trying to decide whether she's certain of my presence or merely suspecting it. Come out, Valois. <laughs> so much for that, then. I raise my hands and move noisily into view. Planning to turn on me, weren't you? A caution. You would have done the same. I maybe did. Who's to know? 
I don't think she could have managed to hide her own allies in the same thicket we were hiding in earlier. But now that she's calling the shots, she might indeed be leading us to them. <laughs> Get over there next to him. Since Callum apparently wants me to play along, I obey her instructions and walk past her to stand beside him. The traitorous servant then produces a silk scarf which she hurls in our direction. Tie yourselves together. Is this some sort of joke? You're the one playing Jester's tricks, fancy boy. Should have come alone. I've always wondered why you weren't dismissed from service. You make a terrible page. Well then, good that it's settled. Now do as I say. Arm or leg, I don't care. Callum picks up the scarf and extends his left hand to me. I'm not quite sure what he has in mind, but I place my right hand in his. He winds the scarf over and around and through our shared clasp, creating something that looks like a knot but isn't actually. We are not tied, only tangled. And it's still and it will not take long to free ourselves again. Dolores can't tell quite what he's done unless she comes closer to examine it, of course, and she seems disinclined to take such a step. Despite his brief show of resistance, Callum seems quite calm about the setbacks the rogue page has put in our path. Of course, he still thinks we have Oscar in reserve, and I cannot tell him that my prince has been left behind. We resume our course through the woods step by step. For good or for ill, Dolores' voice is our guide. And then at last we see it, a splash of pink across the forest floor. Cass! Instinctively, he starts to move towards his fallen sister, and his motion tugs at our joined hands. That moment of distraction is what Dolores has apparently been waiting for. <laughs> Abandoning us and the remaining half of her ransom gold, she turns to flee. Go! We rush after her as best as we can. <laughs> It is not so easy as one might think to run in a forest, particularly while entangled with another. We could, of course, pause for a moment and remove the silk wrapping, but that would require that we pause. Instead, Callum crushes my fingers in his grip as we attempt a synchronized pursuit. She is one and we are two, and in this terrain that gives her an advantage. She's going to get away. We're losing. And then, quite unexpectedly, I hear a shout. Ah! It's Oscar! Somehow or other, he must have gotten himself loose from his predicament and tried to catch up with us, only to find himself directly in Dolores' escape path. He's not bigger or faster than she is, but he is there, and she can't swerve away in time. In one desperate leap, he tackles her to the ground, but that doesn't bring an end to it. Wrestling is not a sport that ever held Oscar's interest. With an angry woman in his grasp, a woman who has no qualms about using her knees and her teeth, he is completely ineffectual. A few painful for him moments later and she has struggled free. But by that point, it is too late. Ugh. Callum's angry face always freaks me out. Callum has a hand in her hair and an arm around her neck. This is the only payment you'll receive. Her eyes bulge as the pressure around her neck increases. Stop! Don't kill her! I told you I wouldn't murder for you. We've caught her. That's enough. A traitor deserves death. So tie her up and bring her back to stand trial. <laughs> Looks like you haven't told them. Her eyes roll back into her head and she sags in Callum's grip. No! She's only unconscious. <sighs> well, so be it. Tie her up if that's what you want. We have to get back to Cass. Between us, Oscar and I handle Dolores' limp body binding her with a discarded silk scarf. She is not a very substantial woman, more wiry than bulky, and easy enough for the two of us to carry. So, Dolores was the mastermind all along? Could she really have overpowered Oscar and spared it off Cassidy all by herself? I saw them struggling here in the forest. I can imagine she'd get the better of him eventually in a brawl, but disabling him too quickly to cry out? And then dragging the princess away, keeping her hidden, leading me on a merry dance, spying on Callum, setting up, <clears throat> setting up a ransom exchange? That's a lot to manage for a rough-spoken girl who's never progressed past the rank of page. Hmm. There must be more to her story than I'm seeing. Who sponsored her to royal service? Why hasn't she been either advanced or dismissed? She is someone's agent, I'm certain, but whose, and what is their part in this? 
And yet Callum insisted that she was working alone, and motivated by gold, not by politics. And the last thing Dolores said was that Callum hadn't told us the whole story. Could she be his agent and turned on him? But that doesn't make any sense. Last night, Callum said he'd never had a trusted assistant like me. I may have some questions for that woman when she wakes up, but in the meantime, we have a princess to rescue. We return to where we first spotted that telltale glimpse of, pale, of pink fabric in the forest. There, Cassidy lies, quiet and unmoving at the base of a tree. Not a fairy tale girl in a glass coffin. This princess's hair and clothes have been snagged by leaf and twig, her shoes are gone, her stockings horribly stained, and she's tied and blindfolded with more of those silk scarves. Poor Cassidy. Is she alright? Do you have any heartshorn spirits? Uh. There is a faint moaning noise and Cassidy's head shifts. She's awake! Get her untied and sitting up, carefully. Callum hangs back while Oscar and I help Cassidy to her feet and remove the blindfold. What? Ah! It's alright, you're safe now. We've captured the woman who kidnapped you. Safe, but... She ducks behind Oscar and raises a trembling hand. He's the one that kidnapped me! She's pointing at... Callum? You stole Princess Cassidy? No, not exactly. That is not Princess Cassidy. What are you saying? I would like to introduce you to my brother, Prince Caspian. What? Oscar takes a step backwards, sheltering Cassidy. Or is it Caspian? Behind him. You are mad. It was you who attacked us in the garden. Is Callum our enemy? Or is he telling the truth? Ooh, so interesting. Ugh. Need some more water? <clears throat> Let us have him explain the situation to us. Let's not get too excited here. We're all supposed to be friends. Callum, do you want to explain what in the world you're talking about? You would think with the years I've spent planning for this moment, I would have a better idea of what to say. This isn't how I meant it to turn out. Your prince is right. I did attack him in the garden, but only him. I would never have hurt Cass. I just wanted to talk to him alone. If you wanted to talk to Oscar alone, why did you make me go with you? You really don't remember anything, do you? Wait, hold on. I'm trying to understand. So Callum, you're saying that that is your brother Caspian? Yes. I am not! And you took her, or him, from the dance last night because you wanted to talk to her? Yes. Then how did Dolores get involved in this? I left Cass in my rooms alone while I waited for the fuss to die down. That thieving page must have somehow found him there and decided to grasp the advantage. I should never have left you alone. What, you're sorry that someone else kidnapped the princess after you had properly kidnapped her first? You may have found some crumb of courage, but you are still a fool. I was willing to risk anything for my goal. Except Cass's safety. What goal? Saving my little brother, who was stolen from me all those years ago. I'm very sorry, but... You're delusional. I am not Caspian. Prince Caspian died when I was a baby. That's what everyone believes. That doesn't mean it's the truth. I assume there's a story behind this. Why are you listening to anything he says? He lied to us. He attacked us. He forced you. I'm listening to him because I want to understand what's going on. Wisdom before judgment. And whose wisdom do you think you are? What? No, she's right. We should talk about this calmly. Once we all understand what we're thinking and feeling, then we can come to a solution that benefits everyone. But if you please, I'd like to sit down. Of course, you should rest. He gallantly sweeps the patch of grass free of twigs and beetles. Sorry, Oscar, not gonna be your wisdom this time round. You are very kind. Once they've settled themselves, Callum begins his tale. <coughs> Cass was my little brother, and the closest person to me in the world. 
All of our other siblings were much older, men in the making. In the meanwhile, our royal parents seemed to have little interest in their youngest offspring. I know now why it was, but at the time it never occurred to me to question. My life was the nursery, my toys, my minders, and my baby brother, who trusted me in everything. Then they came and took Cass away. They said he was ill, that he was coming down with the plague and had to be quarantined with special nurses. I never saw him again. It was half a year later that they told me he was dead. But if he was ill, and we were always together, why was I fine? If he had to be confined, why not me? That's it? That's your reason for believing that Cassidy is Caspian? Of course not. At the time, that was, m that was my reason for believing that life was unfair and would always be so. I wasn't interested in my new little sister. I didn't want a replacement for Cass, so I didn't think about the princess. But that baby grew older, and still she never came to the nursery. Years, and I never saw her once. Sometimes I wondered if I were the one with the plague, who had to be kept away from my siblings. And then I was old enough that my parents were forced to give me my own rooms and full-time tutors. And once you were gone, then they took the nursery for the princess. I suppose. I didn't much care. I was used to it by then, being shoved aside, out of the way, ignored. It wasn't until a public event when Cassidy was about five years old that I finally laid eyes on the princess. And it was Caspian. Older, too old for five years, and wearing a dress, but I knew his face. She is your sister. It's not that strange that she might look a lot like Caspian. Not similar in some way. The same face. Look at me. Do I have the same face Cass does? Well, no. No one else saw it. No one else knew him like I did. I didn't even question why he was there. All I knew was that my brother was alive. I ran up to him, calling his name. That was when my father hit me. I... I remember that. That boy... That was you? They told me he was a thief who snuck in, and that he might have carried the pox. That was why they beat him. Yes, you would remember the beating. Your father beat you? No, he had the guards take me away and teach me a lesson, once only. That I was wrong, and a fool, and a disgrace, and that I was never to go near Cassidy again. I had no idea. I'm so sorry. You have no need to be sorry. You didn't cause it. You wanted to see your brothers, remember? He turns back to Callum. Your parents treated you unfairly, that's, that's clear, but it proves nothing. You made wild accusations in public, and they did not want the scandal. Considering what it's led to now, it seems they were correct that you would bring them grief. Caspian and Cassidy are different people. Cassidy was born before Caspian died. It's public record. Yes, and for so long I couldn't understand it. I almost started to believe that I was wrong. Then it all became clear. Caspian and I were nothing to them. The infant Cassidy was the heir my parents had been longing for. I think that baby died, and my wise mother could bear no more children. There could be no further princess. And so I believe they chose to switch Cassidy for Caspian, and raise him as the heir of Gwellinor. They've done it so well that even he doesn't remember who he really is. Cass, they kept you isolated so that no one would break the illusion, so that I couldn't tell you the truth. Everything I've done was to get you out of their clutches, so that you could be free. They stole your life. I'm here to give it back. But I... There's one obvious problem with this whole story. <clears throat> Caspian was a boy. Caspian is a girl. There you go. Um, I mean, you are, aren't you? Of course I am! You can't simply put a dress on a boy and call him a girl. It wouldn't work. Bind a living thing tightly enough and its growth can be stunted. He looks at his sister and his voice takes on a hesitant tone. They've kept you so isolated. I have to ask. 
Do you know what is different between a man and a woman? Men explore and conquer. Women nurture and defend. Not what I meant. What I think he's trying to say is that men's bodies are different from women's bodies. Yes, that's why women wear gowns. That's true, but it's more of a question of what's under the gown. Have you ever seen men and women unclothed? What? You can't ask a lady a question like that. She can, being a lady herself. I, of course I haven't. It wouldn't be proper. In paintings or statues, perhaps? Books of engravings? I would never look at such things. Not even Sylvia de Gosser's The Myriad Ways? It's very famous. Convenient, isn't it, that they've sheltered their princess so profoundly? There's nothing unusual about a princess being modest. Yes, but so much so that she can't even grasp the point of what we're asking? What point? Oh, for soil's sake. <laughs> we turn to discover that Dolores is apparently no longer unconscious. Still bound, she twists herself part upright to speak. <laughs> You're in a ridiculous position down there. They're trying to find out if you have a tail in front. A what? How long have you been listening? Oscar's face. Long enough, Lady Lackey. I should have shut your mouth permanently. Oh, and then who'd you have to take the tasks your noble hands are too pure to carry? If none of you have the eggs, I'll lift her skirts and see if she's got them. What? No, no one is lifting any skirts. It isn't necessary. There are other signs. I am, after all, supposed to be trained to observe. I set my preconceptions aside and examined Cassidy closely. She has a slim figure and a narrow waist. Her bosom, while quite modestly endowed, has a feminine shape to it. That much could be achieved by a slender dandy in a corset, but other features are far more difficult to alter. Look at her hands. She has long and graceful arms, but small hands. Men's hands are larger in relation. Her chin is smooth and soft and has no hair, and her throat lacks the male bulge. And her voice... That is your natural voice, isn't it? You're not forcing yourself to speak in a high tone? No! You didn't have your voice mysteriously change a few years ago. No! Well, there you have it then. She's a woman. We did it. Done. I did tell you that. But you're Caspian. You have to be. Don't you remember me at all? The nursery. You and I. You used to stand on the window seat and point at things outside to make me tell you about them. You liked to watch me fire a catapult or spin a top, because you couldn't make it go as fast. Your favorite toy was a stuffed cloth purple dragon. You used to sleep with it. My favorite toy was a little blue bear that I carried around with me everywhere. I don't remember ever seeing a toy catapult, and I didn't enjoy spinning tops. Mostly, I liked dressing up my dolls and having them act out stories. She walks closer and lays her hand on Callum's arm. I'm sorry, but the truth is, Caspian is gone. I... I'm sorry. He sounds like he was a sweet little boy. I wish I'd known him. I wish I'd known any of you. I was always so lonely growing up. So you're... really Cassidy. I really am. Why does my chest feel strangely heavy when I see the light go out of his eyes? Then everything. It was all for nothing. No. To his evident surprise, she wraps her arms around him, nestling her chin on his shoulder. It meant that we got to be together and talk to each other at last. Otherwise, we would still be strangers. Hug me back? Nobody ever hugs me. Ah, you are so cute. Slowly, cautiously, Callum puts his arms around his sister. I don't know why our parents treated you so badly, or why they kept us apart, but it was wrong. But I'm an adult now. They can't lock me away. We can start over. She steps away from him, still smiling. What you did, you did because you loved your brother. 
That's not wrong. Yeah, really sweet. <laughs> now since we're all loving and forgiven, how about you let me go? You are going back to the castle to face trial. I ought to get rid of her right now. It would save trouble. Because I can tell everyone that it was you who attacked Lady Fainting Blossom? Sure, you could kill me so I couldn't talk. But then you'd have to kill Miss Nosy and Prince Simple too, huh? What? Was that your plan? Of course not. My brother wouldn't do such a terrible thing. She's certainly loyal and forgiving, considering that she's more or less just met him and he kidnapped her. Let's defend him. Of course he wasn't planning to kill us. It wouldn't make any sense. He's outnumbered. With two on one, it would be much too likely for one of us to defeat him or escape. If Callum wanted to cover his tracks that way, the smart thing to do would have been to leave Oscar in the castle. Then he could kill Dolores, then kill me, then hide the bodies, and Oscar and Cassidy would never know what happened. I pause, realizing that everyone is staring at me. What? Sometimes your mind works in strange ways. I find her logic refreshing. What were you planning to do with us, then? If Cassidy were Caspian and everything went as you planned. None of this is what I planned. Ever since that creature put a stick in the wheel. What wheel? It's an expression, Tao Zha. Oh, forgive me, my lord. My years of letters must have slipped my mind again. There is another question. What would you have done with Caspian, if she had been him? Done whatever he wanted. I wanted to tell him about everything he'd missed, growing up, and help him find his own life again. Help him get out of the palace, or prepare him to confront our parents if he wanted. It doesn't matter now. No, it doesn't. Well, I'll, we'll go home. We will talk to mother and father. This time they can't brush you aside. I won't let them. I will make them explain what they've done. So you see, it will be alright. Oh, I hope so. Only... Could I have some water? And something to eat? Of course. You didn't feed her? What was I supposed to feed her with? I didn't bring her royal kitchen. What did you eat? <laughs> I weren't hungry. I was going to be rich if I relied on my feet. If I made it, I could eat anything I wanted. If I didn't, well, it wouldn't matter, would it? No, it won't. Oscar, in the meantime, is still looking at Cassidy. What happened to your shoes? I think they're still in the palace. If she went through those tunnels without shoes, we need to wash her feet before any scratches turn foul. I don't mean to be trouble. You aren't. Let's get back to the water. There's nothing more to do here. We have, after all, succeeded in our quest. The princess is saved, and we are heroes. All is well. Hooray.